Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it because UCT, I guess, is dear to all of our hearts and I appreciate you continuing to support the university. I'm going to talk tonight about the topic that's kind of a little bit controversial at the moment, but I want to make the point, why do you go to university? You go to university to learn that there are two sides to every argument. And the controversial people are the ones who don't see that. I'm not controversial. I'm just telling you there are two sides to the argument. There's nothing controversial about that. That's why you went to university. And it astonishes me when people say I'm controversial. I'm just an educator. That's all I am. <laughs> so I'm going to talk tonight about the, the two sides of the argument. And I'm going to show you where the science lies, where the real science lies. And hopefully, I will change your minds by the end of the talk. I must tell you, this is the most important component of medicine today. There is nothing more important. Nothing. Forget, of course, HIV is important. Of course, tuberculosis is important. This is much more important. And the, the Nobel Prizes that are coming in 20 years are going to be in this. And I can tell you exactly where they're going to come from. And, and the University of Cape Town better realize and get on board quickly if they want to win Nobel Prizes in this and not say it doesn't exist, what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> so that's the, the, that's the side. The, the book, one of the books I wrote about my scientific experience at UCT is titled Challenging Beliefs. And it looks at areas that I've challenged over the years. And it started when I was studying with Lionel Opie, and the first question we asked, are, are marathon runners immune from heart disease? Because it was said at the time that marathon runners don't have heart attacks, and we disproved that by 1979. And that also caused much unhappiness because runners thought they could live forever. Then there was whether neck injuries in, in rugby are preventable, and that was also catastrophic for, for me. I mean, I was demonized by Dr. Donny Craven as the worst thing that ever happened to South African rugby. Now today, South African rugby is, has some of the best preventive measures in all of rugby. And the science that is applied in South African rugby is recognized as the best in the world. And so they've gone from denying the science to accepting it. Then the book on overhydration or waterlogged is this, Does Dehydration or Overhydration Kill in Sport? And we were able to show that overhydration is the real problem and there's no such thing as dehydration. Dehydration, if you, if you get thirsty, you drink, that's it. You don't get dehydrated. So you have to force it and get more and more thirsty and then you might become a little bit dehydrated. But dehydration is a term that was generated by industry to sell product, as, as they always do. And that sensitized me to the way the industry works, that they, they make a, a disease which may or may not be real, and then they've got the only product that cures it, so you have to buy their product. <laughs> <laughs> do carbohydrates give you energy? That hasn't ended, notice. It's going to go on for a bit further. Should cyclists wear helmets? I remember coming out writing in the, the Argus cycle tour that there were three deaths in Cape Town in one month, and I said it's because the guys aren't wearing helmets. And they said, we will never allow helmets in the Argus cycle tour because they damage the image of the sport. The next year they made it mandatory. <laughs> it was <laughs> one year. Uh, do the muscles regulate exercise performance? And a lot of our work has shown that the brain is what regulates performance, and that's absolutely you know, mind-boggling because when I started in the sciences, we, we, we were taught that lactic acid is produced by the muscles and that causes fatigue, and that's completely bogus. The brain is in control. And, and I'll, sh I'll talk tonight about why we get wrong when we forget the role of the brain. Are professional rugby players overplayed? That's also not finished. That will be an ongoing saga. And again, the, the players are grossly overplayed. And they're overplayed for financial reasons. And until rugby gets a better financial structure, the players will be in trouble. I went with Lewis Pugh, another UCT graduate, to the North Pole. And he swam at minus 1.8 degrees centigrade in only a speedo. And so we were able to prove that that was possible. And then the thing that's going to keep me going for the rest of my life is, are low-fat diets healthy? I.e., is the diet you're eating healthy? And incidentally, just to make the point, that I, I started with four other doctors, and I wasn't the prime mover, but I was one of the first four doctors to start the South African Heart Foundation in Cape Town in 1976. And in 1977, the world body said you must eat this high carbohydrate, low fat diet, and you must cut all fat out of your diet. And I was right there. I was the first guy in line. So for 33 years, I followed this very healthy diet. 
And it was a disaster for my health, a complete disaster. And we'll come to that later. And that made me question this whole thing about the, the low-fat diet. So understand, I've been on both sides of the argument. And, uh, and that's where I come from. Okay. This is why you go to university, to, to give you an open mind and not be scared of new ideas. But if you read George Orwell, this he said what happens. At any given moment, there's an orthodoxy, a body of ideas of which it is assumed that all right-thinking people will accept without question. In, it's not exactly forbidden to say this, that, or the other, but it's not done to say it. Anyone who challenges the prevailing orthodoxy finds himself silenced with surprising effectiveness. A genuinely unfashionable opinion is almost never given a fair hearing, either in the popular press or in the highbrow periodicals. And that is what I've learned. People don't like new ideas. And it was driven home to me recently at the University of Cape Town on October, uh, December the 6th, where I was in debate with this guy here. And I'm not mentioning any names because they said some rude things about me and I don't want you to know who they were. <laughs> but if you read the South African Medical Journal, you can see who these three rude people were. So let's go and see what they said about me after the debate. And if they had introduced me this afternoon, they would have said quite different things than you had. <laughs> so, so it begins. He's a good scientist. Not, not a great scientist. He's a good scientist in his field. But he's way outside of his field and comfort zone. He doesn't understand the science and the whole concept. He's cherry-picked. That's they always say to you, pick a little bit of the information and leave the rest. And misinterpret as going, and is going down a very dangerous path. Applying dietetic principles, he's doing harm and flouting the Hippocratic Oath. That's quite strong from a professor, a, an internationally recognized professor, telling me that I'm flouting the Hippocratic Oath. And this is on the internet for the next million years, or as long as the internet, this is on, okay? So you'd expect better of Tim. He has a good reputation, so this is extremely dangerous. He's been afforded the public space to propound these ideas without scientific validity. I have not been afforded it. I have earned it over the years. That's what it is. People listen because they want to hear what I've said. You don't get the public space unless you've earned it. Now, of course, I may not earn it subsequently, but at the moment, I've earned it. And it's not like, oh, we've given it to you. That doesn't work that way. Damage is being done here. He's radically oversimplified things, she said. It was sad when a good scientist wondered of his area of expertise. I've been in studying nutrition since the 1970s. Is it my area of expertise? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> he's lost the plot. He's not basing all his public statements on the best available data. Now, we're going to look whether their statements are on the best available data. Yes, he's right to question any scientific statement of any type, but please bring the good data. Okay, so in the debate, I presented five facts which I said are irrefutable. Okay, so I presented facts. Now, what you have to see is where they're saying my facts are wrong. Okay. He's entitled to punt something he totally believes in, but what's scary is damaging patients. Damaging patients and the population by insisting on this diet for life regardless of the cost. My overwhelming emotion is sadness that a person of his stature has made this mistake. Well, in your opinion, it's a mistake, but that's your opinion, and it might not be the right opinion. You go, you go to the public when you have irrefutable evidence that this is the right thing to do. Now what I'm going to show you, in 1977 when the diet was changed, I'm going to show you what irrefutable evidence they had to change the global diets. And you decide whether it's irrefutable or not. Because that's the key moment in this whole debate is 1977, when our diet changes. And we want to see, was it irrefutable evidence that they used to change the way we eat or not? I think Professor Rousseau showed him up based on science and Tim's rather superficial understanding of epidemiology. It highlighted his lack of appreciation of the complexities of fat metabolism. You'd expect better of him. He has a good reputation, so this is extremely dangerous. Okay, so I'm killing people again, notice. 
He's been afforded the public space to profound these ideas with scientific, without scientific validity. Okay, well, we'll see who's got the validity. Noakes' theory has the potential to divert people from diets and treatments that were known to be good. Were? That were known to be good? They should be are known to be good. Why didn't, why didn't that person say are known to be good? Why didn't they say, why did she say were or he say were? That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> were I, now listen, were I still a faculty member at UCT, I'd be very concerned about this member under doing a lot of good work done in heart disease prevention. If Noakes come, came up against anyone in this field, he would get the same reception he got at this faculty meeting, this continuing debate, i.e. he'd be strongly criticized. But when you generalize and say everyone should be on the diet permanently, eat your fats and no carbs, that's not right, especially when there are no long-term data on that while there are data on the conventional diet. Well, we'll look at the data on the conventional diet and then why mess with success? And we'll come to that. Why is the mess with success? That's a crucial point. Advocating it for wider health promotion will not stand the test of time. Okay, now I'm going to show you today that this diet has stood the test of time. The fad diet is the 1977 diet. Humans have been eating the diet that I'm proposing for 2.5 million years. And it began right here in Johannesburg, 2.5 million years ago. <laughs> okay, so, so that's the debate. And that's the opposition. And, and, and the question you have to ask, I mean, these are genuine people who genuinely think that they're doing good and helping people and that I should be stopped because I'm harming people. Who are harming? These, these are not lunatics. They're honorable, credible people. But, but why do they say these things, which are clearly unethical and, and potentially uh, damaging? Why, what drives people to say those things? Okay, so that's, that's the, the question. Right, let's go and ask the qu patients what they think, okay? Because if your theory works, then the patients must love it. This is a gentleman from Cape Town, from Hart Bay, who on, in July, in the middle of July last year, can't fit in the seat of his aeroplane, the aeroplane seat flying economy back to Cape Town. And he overlaps into the other seat, and next to him is a lovely old lady, and she starts tweeting or something that this man is grossly obese and he's in my space and I'm having a terrible flight. And he, the guy gets so embarrassed that he gets in his car and he drives to his general practitioner and arrives there late in the afternoon and she says to him, you've got high blood pressure and you've got diabetes. I must hospitalize you now because you're going to die before tomorrow morning, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. so he says, no. Give me six months. I'm going home, and I'm going to find the solution. So he goes on the internet, and very quickly he discovers the so-called Noakes diet. And he says, that's it. I'm trying the Noakes diet. Okay, now, now this very important point. He got his information off the internet. He did not consult the doctor, and he did everything himself. And that's the future, ladies and gentlemen, of medicine. Medicine is in real trouble because either you cure this guy or you don't. And if you don't, he will find someone who will cure him. And that's the future of medicine with the internet. D do you think he hasn't tried to lose weight? I'll give you another example later. But so he goes away and seven months later, he loses 80 kilograms by himself. By himself. Okay. Now, did I kill this patient? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in other words, we must put him back on the healthy diet he was eating and make him lose, gain the 80 kilograms. Okay, now he has no diabetes, he has no high blood pressure, and he says, thank you, Dr. Noakes, for saving my life. Now, if I can cure one more person of morbid obesity, the only medical treatment known for this guy is gastric bypass surgery. That's what medicine does. And I cured this guy without ever seeing him without ever consulting him. If I can do it for one person, I can do it for two. If I can do it for two, I can do it for four. If I can do it for four, I can do it for 16. If I can do it for 16, I can do it for everyone in the world. Okay. Because I understand what the condition is. And this is called food addiction. And I'm going to show it tonight. It's food addiction. That's what causes obesity. And you never hear it. They never talk about it.
but that's the cause. Okay. So here's my favorite doctor. He wasn't a UCD alumnus. He's from Stellenbosch University, I suspect. So, so, <laughs> so he is 57 years old. He goes to his wife and he says, Dear wife, I am dying. I am not going to make 65 years because I'm a medical doctor and I have diabetes, which puts me at high risk of death. I have atrial fibrillation, which means the atrium in the heart is no longer contracting properly, and that puts you at high risk of developing stroke. I have sleep apnea. He couldn't sleep without a machine on his mouth to, to keep his glottis open. Uh, he had hypertension, gout, and flaky skin. He hears me talk on carte blanche, and where I had a chop, where Derek Watts showed me a chop, and he said, am I allowed to eat the, meat, the, the fat? And I said, you should just eat the fat and throw the meat away. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, the Heart Foundation went ballistic when they had that from that. <laughs> so, so this is the picture from, from two days ago. I went to see him. He's lost 25 kilograms. Here he is. He's a new man. No diabetes, no atrial fibrillation, no sleep apnea, normal blood pressure, no gout, and smooth skin. And, and he has, it's revolution in his life and his medical care, and all the patients he sees now are offered this medical option. So this, he has what we call the metabolic syndrome, which according to medicine is untreatable, uncurable. It's irreversible. But yet in 1967, Dr. Raven in Stanford University showed that this disease is a disease of carbohydrate excess in the diet. And if you cut carbohydrates, the disease goes away. So why didn't it get out into real medicine? Why was it high hidden? And it was hidden because it came out at the wrong time, when the world was moving towards eating more fat and less carbohydrate. So there we are. So this guy's cured of, of an incurable condition. And for, as far as he's concerned, it's a miracle. He was treated by medicine. He was treated by, by dietitians. He tried every single diet. He was told to eat less food and to eat, keep the high carbohydrates and eat lots of fruit and vegetables because they're healthy. And his weight just went up and up and up and nothing worked. And it was only when he changed to this particular diet that he was helped. So I could go on like that. We have a clinical trial, data from a clinical trial run in Canada showing that we were able to, to reverse 50% of a group of patients in Canada who had this, this condition, the metabolic syndrome, in eight months. 50% of the patients were cured in eight months of an incurable medical condition. Okay. So the problem is people are fed by the food industry which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry which pays no attention to food. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... And, and, and I would say, from my experience now, I suspect 80% of illness... Of, of chronic illness, not acute illness, chronic illness is, is dietary related, 80%. And yet we don't even teach that at the medical schools at all. And if we're not going to look into diet and nutrition, we're just going to miss the boat. Okay, so, so there's, how about some athletes? Here's Bruce Fordyce, uh, who I've been coaching on nutrition for since 1979. So 1984, by then, we said, Bruce, it's all carbohydrates. You've got to eat more carbohydrates. You run faster. And he ran fast, and he set world records, and so on and so forth. And he kept eating. But by 2009, he's not looking so great. <laughs> okay. And he doesn't mind me showing this, because he's got a book now, you see? And his legs look dreadful. Look at these beautiful legs here. They look dreadful. And he's got fat on his back, and so on and so forth. So he's not looking great. He has the metabolic syndrome, I would guess, if we tested him. And I'll, so what is he? We tell him to change diet. He loses 12 kilos, and this is him now. He's the top master's runner in Southern Africa. And in the New York City Marathon two years ago, he was the second in his age group. He runs 18 minutes for five kilometers at altitude at the age of 56 and breaks three hours comfortably in the marathon. He couldn't do it in this state. He now no longer eats carbohydrates at all, or, or very few. He ran the two oceans this year, no carbohydrate loading, no carbohydrates during. He just drank water. And you know, afterwards, he came up to me and he said, Tim, I wonder what would happen if in 1980 you had told me to go on a high-fat diet, not a high-carbohydrate diet. 
because his impression was he would have done better. Yeah, he would have done better, which is frightening. Okay, so that's Bruce. So then, so Bruce, uh, that's, what, that's what he does now, 12 kilogram light, he's running very fast. This is another champion, Oscar Chalupski. Came to see me December two years ago, or a year and a half ago, and he was in terrible shape. He was a butterball. And, and he said, I've heard about this high fat diet, what must I do? I said, Oscar, you are the prime candidate, you're gonna do very well. He goes on the diet. This is the Molokai challenge, which he has won 11 times. And at the, he's won it in his teens, 20, 30, 40. Now, he was 49 this year going into the race. And he competes. It's a world championship event, which means he's competing against 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds, Olympic gold medalists, the whole bunch. bunch. There's no, no thing for his age. He's just got to compete. So he arrives at the start 16 kilograms lighter, and people can't recognize him because they've seen what's happened over the last 10 years. Or, and he's been getting slower and slower. And 26,000 paddle strokes later, he wins the race by 16 seconds against the world's best. He's one of the oldest world champions in the world. In a, in a week or two's time, he competes at the age of 50. He's even lighter now and even stronger. And he had one of his best performances ever recently. So we're backing him to win at the age of 50 against these 20 year olds from Australia and North America. <laughs> so, 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 so there's something about the diet not so bad for athletes either. And there's myself, I lost 20 kilograms and I'm not a world champion, but the, <laughs> so, and it's also, <laughs> but this is, this is Oscar on his original diet, the healthy, athletic, high carbohydrate diet. Again, a BUP and the metabolic syndrome. Incidentally, Bruce went to his doctor recently, the guy said, you've got the metabolism of a 26 year old. His heart rate's 36, his resting heart rate's 36. The guy said, his metabolism is unbelievable. Everything is just unbelievable. So, so the, but he wasn't like it then. Everything improved. Eating a high fat diet. Okay, so that athletes are doing pretty well too. Right. Now the thing about is you have to read and people don't read and that's also something one has to do. You go to universities to learn. And these are three books one needs to read to get the background for the whole debate. Good calories, bad calories, Gary Torb's a genius. This is one of the most important books in medicine. No one should practice medicine without reading it. He describes the history of nutrition from early days right through to today and where it changed. Then if you want to know about whether you should be taking a statin, because I know 50% of you will be taking statins, uh, you should read The Cholesterol Conspiracy. And that, this gives you a full analysis of whether or not heart disease is caused by cholesterol. All the evidence is there. Not just the positive evidence, all the negative evidence. And all the negative evidence filled 1,300 pages. But he cut it down to, for general public. And then this is Bad Pharma. Ben Goldacre has written Bad Pharma and Bad Science. They're two brilliant books. Bad Science is easier to read. Bad Pharma is perhaps a bit long and ingewikkeld. But it really tells you where from the pharmaceutical industry is today. OK, and, th and there we go. So what's wrong with medicine? This is the current model in allopathic medicine. One condition, one cause, one treatment, and it's always a pill. And that's unfortunately not true because conditions are not caused by one thing uh, that you can treat. And I've shown you that, that. I've shown you diabetes, obesity, uh, hypertension. They link to your nutrition in many ways. And you can't correct that. You can't override that by trying to give medication. And so heart disease, is, heart disease is caused by high cholesterol and you take statins and that's the solution. Okay, well, it's not quite that simple. So the story starts in, really it starts in 1957. Because up till then, people were eating the diet that I propose. Until 1957. If you went to a doctor in 1957 with obesity, he would have said, we know carbohydrates cause obesity, you will go on a high fat diet. That was, treat, that was the medical treatment globally. And you had to be around in 1957 to know that. <laughs> okay. So, but then it changed. And it changed, and I'll show you. So now it changed. All of a sudden, fat was bad for you. And that caused your cholesterol to go up. That caused your arteries to get clogged. So you've heard the word artery-clogging saturated fats. 
And they were all, it's one phrase. So a cardiologist would just tell you that. He doesn't say clogged arteries. He also adds the saturated fat component to it. And so then you have heart attacks and all these things, you see. Now, th this is a very simple explanation. And Einstein said, make it simple, but not too simple. And the problem with this is it's too simple. And it's not true. So in the debate, the professor said that if you have a high cholesterol, it drives the cholesterol into the arteries. There's no pathway by which cholesterol in the artery here can get across the blood vessel. There's no, there's no pathway for that to happen in a normal blood vessel. Because there have to be pathways, there have to be receptors and so on for the cholesterol to get in. And there are none. So that's bogus. So anyone who thinks that just having high cholesterol causes the cholesterol to sort of push into the arteries is wrong. The artery has first to be damaged, and then the cholesterol comes along. And the one current theory is that this is, these are the policemen. They're trying to fix the problem. And you can try and you can shoot the policeman, but that's not going to help you in the long term. So you get the point. There is one argument. I'm not saying which is right. The one argument that the cholesterol is there to try and patch up damage. But because the damage is so excessive and happening continuously, it can't prevent the problem. So then you get the plaque formed and you get ruptures and heart attacks. It's much more likely that the irritation is caused by carbohyd abnormal carbohydrate metabolism. So at every time you take carbohydrates, and particularly if, like me, you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, you shoot your glucose and your insulin, that irritates the artery and causes damage. And the damage then is sealed up by the cholesterol coming in to try and fix up the damage. But you continue to eat your carbohydrates, and it gets worse. But it, there's another component which you never hear about, the omega-6, omega-3 component. Now, in, in animals that are, that are raised in the pastures, they don't have much omega-6 in their polyunsaturated fats. And the vegetable oils, or the oils that we should be eating, like avocado, and, and, and other, which will come to some nuts, they're full of omega-3 oils. So humans evolved eating omega-3 polyunsaturated oils. The vegetable oil industry came along in the 1970s and jumped on this bandwagon and told us polyunsaturated oils, omega-3s are bad, or, or saturated fats are bad for you. You must eat the omega-6 vegetable oils. They were told in 1977 that omega-6 vegetable oils cause heart disease and cancer. And there was data already. And that person was marginalized. Today, everyone knows that that day, those data are true. That, the, that when you take, for example, the, mar, the, the, the block of margarine that you're eating, that was once an oil. And it's been turned into a solid substance by chemical processes, which make it utterly foreign to your body. Completely foreign. So when you eat it, your body can't really incorporate it properly into the normal pathways. It is incorporated into your cells, and those cells no longer function normally. In the 1920s, when we didn't have heart disease, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in our food was 2 to 1. 2 to 1. We had no heart disease. It is now 30 to 1. We have lots of heart disease. So what we've done is we've taken saturated fats out of the diet, and we've replaced them with omega-6 vegetable oils, which are highly toxic for humans. And that was the trade-off that happened. So to summarize, what you don't want is a glucose that's all over the place all the time, and insulin that's all over the place all the time. And you don't want cells that are full of omega-6, because that combination, in my view, is what kills us. And it doesn't just cause heart disease. It causes many other things. And, and you will find Alzheimer's disease is going to be linked to high-carbohydrate diets. We're almost there. The proof's almost there. The proof is almost there that, that cancer of the breast and cancer of the colon are carbohydrate-induced. It's almost there. Not quite. And finally, for any of you who have cancer and you want to know how to treat it, you have to go onto the start. Why? Because the Nobel Prize in 1930 was given to Professor Warburg for showing that cancer cells are quite different from normal cells. Guess what? They can only burn glucose. They cannot burn any other fuel. And if you starve them of glucose, they can regress. And there are some remarkable studies of regression in cancer 
in people put on a ketogenic, high-fat high diet, low-carbohydrate diet. And it's utterly logical because that's the way cancer cells work. And so, and I'll, we'll come back to that, but why is cancer grown? And why has cancer so come, become so prevalent? Maybe it's because cancer loves carbohydrates. And the more carbohydrates you give your body, the more chance the cancer cells have to grow. Okay, so now let's get to the lovely evidence why we changed our diets. Now Ansel Keys lived 100 years, which is interesting. But, uh, and he, didn't, he, he ate what's called a Mediterranean diet, which was, has quite a lot of protein and fat in it, but not as much perhaps as we're, thinking, we're suggesting. In 1957, he, was, he decided that he was going to prove that fat causes heart disease. And the, there's a whole basis for why that happened. And he went and looked at some data from the World Health Organization. It would have taken him 10 minutes to draw up this graph. And he showed that Japanese people have low fat intakes in their diet and they have low heart disease rates where the Americans are the opposite. Lots of fat in the diet and lots of heart disease. And then these countries were intermittent between. Now he had data for 22 countries, but he only published these six. He ignored the other six, 16 as we'll show you. And they made the picture look slightly different, but that's not the real point. The real point in science is this is an association. There's an association between this and that. That does not mean that this caused that. But for some reason, he managed to blind the entire world and the entire cardiology profession that you can assume causation from this data, and you can't. What he's saying is that the only difference between Japanese men and the United States men, as far as heart disease goes, is that these guys eat more fat. In other words, there's no, no difference in smoking, there's no difference in diabetes rates. There's no difference in their, in their sugar intakes. There's no difference in diabetes or hypertension or anything. Nothing. And of course, that's bogus. You can't conclude that. So, so these were the data that then changed the whole world's opinion. And so now, all of a sudden, fat became a problem. But this is an observational study. You have to remember that. What happened next was this committee, the McGovern Committee in 1977, was about to go out of business. And they had to come up with something important. So they said, well, let's decide what Americans should eat. So they said, this is what you must eat. We said, we've got keys as data. And fat is the killer, so we must reduce consumption of fat. And we must switch from saturated fat to, to omega-6 vegetable fats. And I want to make one other point. These are not vegetable fats. They are seeds. They come from seeds. Why do you think they're called vegetables? Because you will think they are healthy. But if I told you they're seeds and they have to be extracted under pressure with hexene and chemicals and all sorts of stuff, maybe you think maybe that's not quite such a vegetable. Reduce cholesterol to one egg per day. Eggs are the most nutritious food you can find on this earth. The most nutritious foods. And we kick them out. The only thing they lack is vitamin C. Otherwise, they are. The when Keyes died, he said, I was wrong. Cholesterol in the diet's got nothing to do with your blood cholesterol. Okay? So you, Keyes, if he were speaking today, he would say, eat as many eggs as you like. And eggs are the basis for health. Listen to that. If you're not eating for eggs for breakfast, don't expect to live as long as you could. <laughs> It, and, and I'm not funded by the egg board either. <laughs> <laughs> Eat more carbohydrates, especially grains. And this report was writ written, written by Nick Merton, a vegan, a vegan who had no training in nutritional sciences. These guys admit they were guessing. They were guessing. They admit they were guessing. But that was the evidence. And now government was behind it, and that became the problem. But many people said that it's bogus. So Philip Handler, who was head of the National Academy of Sciences, said, what right has the federal government to propose that the American people conduct a vast nutritional experiment with themselves as subjects on the strength of so very little evidence? There was not one intervention trial that had ever been done of what happens when you change people's diets, this, you give them this diet, what happens? There was not one single study like that. Yet they changed the world's eating patterns. So please, who's got the science behind them? 
This, there was absolutely no hard science behind this. It was guesswork. They guessed that carbohydrates would make you healthy because fats are so bad for you if you replace it with carbohydrates, you'd do better. So do you think that should be the basis for what we eat, that evidence? Okay, the next thing that happened was Richard Nixon was president. And he decided he wanted the farmers to be wealthier. And he changed the structure of American farming dramatically through this guy, Butts. And what Butts did was he subsidized the production of corn. And they produced, instead of having small farms, all farms were joined up in these huge conglomerates. And corn became produced on an industrial scale, as it's never been done before. And if you go through North America to the farming area, you will see this industrial production of corn. And if you, m most of the food today in America, 50% of it is coming from, is corn-based. It's astonishing. Yeah. So he managed to do it. And, and that brought the cost of food down, and it made the farmers very wealthy. But the costs, of course, to, to our health were different. And to, even today, this, the Food Conservation and Energy Act subsidizes these guys $5 billion per year to grow corn and soy. And those are both omega-6 oils. And you wouldn't want to eat them. Yeah. And that's a, a, a large proportion of what we're eating. Yeah. And then there's $5 billion for other farmers. I suspect it's much more than $5 billion, but that's it. And so that's, the, that's what's happened. Now, if Keyes was around today, I could give him these data and say, Dr. Keyes, these are the most recent data from Europe, where for every country they've got heart disease rates and they've got saturated fat intake. And what it shows is these countries with high heart rates have low saturated fat intake, and these countries have high saturated fat intake and low rates of heart disease. So, Dr. Keyes, that must mean saturated fats prevent heart disease according to his logic of association causation. And it's probably not true. People who eat saturated fat probably eat less sugar and less vegetable oils. And I suspect you'd find that these countries eat more vegetable oils and more sugar and more carbohydrates in general. So the country you want to go and look at is France because they are, and the Swiss and the Japanese are amongst the healthiest. So, and they're eating saturated fat. And it's really interesting. Does saturated fat protect against heart disease? Does it make you healthy? Oh, we don't know. But, but I will show you that, that that's the one thing that's really difficult to get hold of because I've become more and more convinced that saturated fat is what we're missing in the diet. But when you look for it, it's difficult to get hold of. Because when we were hunter-gatherers, the saturated fat was in the animal viscera. And we don't eat the viscera anymore. You know, we just eat the meat, and that's the worst part of the animal. It, everyone knew that. They used to go for the fatty pits, the brain. There's evidence for brains being used, being first eaten 2.7 million years ago. Humans started eating brains. They all knew that the fat was important. And uh, so, so when someone tells you saturated fat's bad for you, you'll see, well, that's interesting, because those countries eating lots of fat are doing well. But the science shows exactly the same. This is a meta-analysis of all these people and their diets in their lives and what they died from. And it showed there was no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of heart disease or cardiovascular disease. Now, that's 2010. That's science, as I understand it. This is the best scientists saying this is the analysis. So anyone who tells you you have to reduce your fat intake to protect against heart disease they're not quoting science. They're quoting a religion, nutrition as a religion. And that's, those are associational studies. In other words, association is what people did during their lives. But there are intervention trials. And the intervention trials show there's no clear effect of changing your dietary fat on total mortality. So if you change your fat intake, reduce it, there's no evidence that makes any difference. But there is, in fact, opposite evidence. And it comes from some of the very big studies that if you have heart disease or diabetes at the start of the trial and you change your diet to become more healthy, your mortality goes up. Mortality goes up. So if you have diabetes and you're told to go on a low-fat diet in these studies, you will do worse than if you stayed eating your normal fat diet. 
And the question is, well, what happens if you add a high fat diet? Maybe you do even better. And the same for heart disease. Now, at the end of the debate, when we were sitting there, the professor, he said, well, you're going to die much before me because you're eating saturated fat. So I said, but hold on. What science do you follow? You know? Okay. So what we did then was we changed the diet from this was the main force foods that we were eating in the nine, up to the 1950s, and we replaced it with this. And this is non-food. Please understand that. What is food? Food is something which was alive until quite recently. <laughs> yeah. And this is processed food, and it is nutritionally, it's got nothing in it. People will say, oh, yes, these potatoes have got vitamin this, that, and the other. But you just get up here, and, or you go into the visceral, animal viscera, and then you'll see vitamin values like you haven't seen before. So then why did Americans suddenly get heart disease and we got worried about it in the 1950s and we wanted to change our diets? Well, there's, you see, this is what happened with the heart disease rates. And they start to plateau actually in the 60s. That, the plateau had already been reached. The problem starts here in the 1920s. So if we want to find out what went wrong, you've got to go back to the 1920s. And that was, remember, that was the end of this First World War. So what happened at the end of the First World War? And many of you will know. But so it's pointless looking here and saying what we're doing here is wrong. Yeah, it's, we've got to look back there. And, and when you look back there, that's what you find, that's cigarette consumption. Cigarette consumption absolutely matches the rise in heart disease. So if you want to know what the real cause of this rise in heart disease, it was cigarette consumption. Of course, nutrition may have played a role, but exercise was the main one. It's not my phone, is it? <laughs> okay. So, everyone happy about that? Now, here's David Gillespie, who is also portly and got the metabolic syndrome. And he cuts sugar, and this is what happens to him. And he writes a book on the dangers of sugar, and he's an Australian. Australia is the second biggest exporter of sugar, so he's a very brave man, because he's taken on sugar in Australia. But he also wrote the book on toxic oils, which is the, the vegetable oils. And he said it's insane to say that ancient foods cause modern diseases. That's, that's logical. Why do you blame the things we're eating now for causing the diseases? Now, you need to look, sorry, the things that we used to eat and we changed from, and they say they're causing our diseases now. Well, what did people used to eat? Well, really interesting, here's a mid-Victorian, study of mid-Victorian working class diet. This was between 1850 and 1870. And I use it because many of us come from, from England, as I do, my parents are from the north of England. And it's really interesting, what did they eat? So this is the study. And, and this is what the guys looked like. This, this is working class people. Their longevity, ladies and gentlemen, was longer, if anything, than ours. And you have to remember that the longe our longevity is artificially increased by the medicines that we take. Okay. And you know that. My father lived 15 years because of medications, but he'd had no quality of life. And I think that's most the same for most of our parents. These guys didn't. They lived their diets full and they died in their sleep. That was how they died. So here they are, and they had an enormous intake of energy every day, and it was full of saturated fat, dairy produce, lots of vegetables, not so much fruit, but lots of vegetables, and lots of meat. And it was a period in time in Britain when the food prices were low, and people, working class, could eat those foods. What happened next was processed foods came in in 1870, 1880 into Britain. And by the time of the Boer War, you didn't have many of these guys left. Their health had deteriorated so much that the, US, sorry, that the British Army had trouble recruiting people to come and fight here who were, who were quality humans, quality human bodies. So within 30 years, a dietary change had changed these guys from being some of the healthiest in the world to being less healthy. And the diet was the original change to processed foods and more sugar and refined carbohydrates. And what did they die from? They died from, this is, un, this 50% is, I admit it's other diseases, and I don't know quite what those were, but they, were, they weren't heart disease and they weren't cancers. This is the can circulatory disease, and that's cancer, less than about 8% of all illnesses were the diseases that now dominate today. 
So you have to say, what's happened? If these people were eating the diet that we've been told not to eat, and they weren't dying of heart disease and cancer, and we're now eating the diet we're told to eat that's going to prevent cancer and prevent heart disease, it does something's wrong. It doesn't make sense. Okay. So when you look back at this diet, you might wonder, what does this contain? So if I take these to the laboratory and analyze them, and this is what they contain. That's it. You might as well go out, instead of eating that banana, just buy a bag of glucose. It's the same. As far as your body is concerned, it's glucose. So that's the diet that you're currently eating. Now, why would you want to eat a diet like this? Even if you're doing enormous amounts of exercise, it's probably not the ideal diet. But that's what's happened. So we shifted from this diet to one that is predominantly refined carbohydrates, which are rap rapidly absorbed and cause your blood glucose to rise. Right. Now, this is a game-changing book written by Michael Moss, who is a very famous writer, and he won the Pulitzer Prize. And the title is Salt, Sugar, and Fat. And it's about the food industry, the processed food industry, and how they use salt, sugar, and fat to addict you to processed foods. Because you have to understand, processed foods taste like cardboard when you take the salt, the sugar, and the fat out of them. They taste like cardboard. So these people have to make them taste palatable. A muffin, if you take the salt and the sugar and, and the fat out, it, it'll taste like cardboard. But you didn't know that because you just want to eat that muffin. But the reason you want to eat that muffin or those Pringle chips is because industry knows how to addict you to that. And there's a thing called the bliss point. So every food that is developed by the industry has gone through testing with thousands of people to define the bliss point. And the bliss point is the optimum concentration of salt, combination of salt, sugar, and fat that will make that food irresistible to you. So that not only you will finish the, what, the sample that you've got, but you will want to eat it again in a few hours' time. So... He went to a meeting, he, 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 sorry, he, didn't get, he found the data from a meeting in 1999 where the seven major CEOs of the major processing food companies in the United States got together because one of them said, we've got a problem. We are the cause of the obesity diabetes epidemic in the United States of America. That's what he said. And he said, either the seven of us do something about it or we're going to kill the nation. So that was on the table. So he gave 120 slide presentation saying that and the first guy got up who was the most important CEO said this don't talk to me about nutrition talk to me about taste and if this stuff tastes better don't run where I'm trying to sell stuff that doesn't taste good that was it so they completely took it off the agenda the fact that these people know that they're the cause of the obesity diabetes epidemic in the United States of America the people who are causing it know does my profession know no why not? Because these guys are so clever that they make sure that we don't ask the right questions. So if you go and look at who funds the dietetics associations around the world, the diabetes associations around the world, the heart foundations around the world, guess what? It's these people. And as Unilever here, we'll come back to the Unilever, but promise you, the, the <laughs> So I think a medical journal decides to take a stance against the diet, you see. So they send out a CD with seven of the top nutritionists of South Africa. I haven't bothered to look at it, but I suspect it's seven talks about what diet you should be eating, funded by the South African Sugar Association. <laughs> it's astonishing, and no one sees the connection. Okay, so these are the weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> and notice this. Ask for more. And, and this is my point. These companies support research activities which promote the unproven theory. Unproven theory, as I'll show you, that obesity is due to reduced energy output, i.e. physical activity, independent of change of energy intake. Now, if I want it to be properly funded, all I have to do is get up today and say, you know why we're all obese? Because we don't do enough exercise. And tomorrow morning, I'll have a check from Coca-Cola saying, Dr. Noakes, would you like to say that in America? Would you like to research that? And, I, 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 you know, I'm not joking. That's how bad it is. Coca-Cola will fund anyone who will get up and say, 
you're all fat because you don't do enough exercise. And so drink your Coke and do more exercise and everything's fun, hunky-dory. So all the processed food industries are driving the story that it's physical inactivity that's causing obesity. And it's got nothing to do with it, as I'll show you. Okay, your, your physical activity has absolutely no impact on your optimum weight. Okay. So here's Unilever, that's what they control. And Unilever controls heart foundations around the world and they tell us to eat omega-6 vegetable oils instead of saturated fats in butter. Because saturated fat's gonna kill you, where there's no evidence for that. Whereas plenty of evidence that the omega-6 vegetable oils are damaging to your health. Okay, so, so let me just see if I, um, yeah, now, now, one of the key points, I think this slide looks like it's out of place, so I'm not, I'm, I'll maybe come back to it, but I don't think we're going to do it. Okay, right. Let's, let's, now may, maybe I will show it to you, because this is important. Sorry, this is important. So, so, what I didn't know, I went through my whole medical training and thought I was an expert, and I did not know I had this condition called carbohydrate resistance. And in fact, I have type 2 diabetes. How did I get it? My father, long family history and then eating lots of carbohydrate, and then you'll see that this then can cause diabetes. So if you continue to eat high carbohydrate diet and you have a family history of diabetes, your risk of developing diabetes is very high. So what, when I showed you Dr. Shonby, the guy who had diabetes, he now no longer has got it, and I've got it. And it's unfair. <laughs> he, was, he was dying and going to die at 65, and he doesn't have diabetes because he corrected it because he got the, his timing was right. Before he completely damaged himself, he was able to recover. But I didn't. Okay, so now what happens in this condition? What these guys did was they, they found people who are highly carbohydrate tolerant, who can eat carbohydrate with relish and not suffer consequences, and the worst, the group who couldn't eat carbohydrates because they showed negative consequences. But these were people who were fit, healthy young men who were completely lean. If you looked at them, you would not know they were sick. So, and what they did was they gave them two carbohydrate meals, and they divided them up into people who are insulin resistant or carbohydrate resistant and those who are insulin sensitive. And this is their blood glucose response. Now, and you'll see the blood glucose has gone up, and it stays quite high, and it went for a time, and then it comes down. But it's not different between the two groups. So superficially, they look the same. I must just add that this is what's toxic. Getting your glucose going up and down all day is what's very toxic. You don't want that. But when they looked at the insulin response, because insulin is what takes carbohydrate out of the bloodstream, and there you see the insulin-resistant people have to secrete much more insulin. And ultimately the system fails, and they can't secrete enough insulin, and then the glucose starts to rise, and then they get all the damage of diabetes. So these are young men in their 20s who already show that they are going to become diabetic in the long term. And this is called insulin resistance or carbohydrate resistance. And the question is, how prevalent is this? Uh, that, that's the real question. Because this is Dr. Shonby and all of us who get the metabolic syndrome. Eat enough carbohydrate and this pushes you into the metabolic syndrome. Now, this is what happens to your triglycerides in the blood, and you all know triglycerides are not so good. Notice the difference, massive difference. The people who are insulin resistant have very high triglycerides, and that indicates that their metabolism is severely abnormal. And then finally, this is new fat produced in response to what they ate. And this group, the carbohydrate-resistant group, start to produce fat in the liver. And this is called non-alcoholic fatty liver which is also a carbohydrate-derived disease. So what you see in these healthy young men who look perfectly healthy, they have abnormal insulin response, they have an abnormal triglyceride, and they're storing fat, and they're going to get fat, and they're going to get the metabolic syndrome. So the, but the point being is this is much more common than anyone will admit. It's much more common. And the kids who get fat at school, they, this is them. And... And the reason is they just can't metabolize carbohydrate normally. And to give them carbohydrates is a disaster. Okay, so the metabolism of every human is not the same. Those with carbohydrate resistance are unable to metabolize carbohydrates safely. And that's what these people will not acknowledge. 
that there's a proportion of people who metabolize carbohydrate very poorly, and they may not be given carbohydrate. Okay, so now I'm going to finish up to, to explain to you why we have obesity and how we can solve the problem. Okay, millions of years to get to this, and it starts here, 3.5 million, million years here in Johannesburg with the discovery of Australopithecus africanus, and that eventually becomes Homo sapiens. The point of this slide is this is how humans are designed. We are designed to be built like that. That's what we should look like. How do I know that? Because have you ever been to the Kruger National Park? And what's the top predator there is the lion. Now, if the lion's the top predator, it should be the fattest animal. But it's not. It's thin. And so it doesn't have any dietitians advising it what to eat. <laughs> it doesn't calorie count. It doesn't look at its portion size. And when it eats a buffalo the one day, the dietitian doesn't say, well, tomorrow you must only eat an impala. <laughs> what happens is the lion responds to normal biological responses in its brain. And it goes and sleeps after the buffalo. It sleeps for four days, and it wakes up, says, I'm hungry, and goes and eats again. <laughs> okay. and, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you should all be. We should all be that way. And in my opinion, you should only be eating every 12 to 24 hours. If you're eating every three hours, you have a food addiction or come to. And you have fallen prey to the processed food industry. Okay. So, so here we go. Here's Australopithecus as she was and discovered, Mrs. Pleas discovered a few miles from here. And she, believe it or not, was a vegetarian. And we are omnivores, and that's us. And the reason we are so big is because we eat fat and protein. And that's what made us big. And we became big because we became fabulous runners. And we were the best midday persistent hunters in the animal kingdom. And one day, three million years ago, Mr. or Mrs. Australopithecus decided to chase an animal and discovered that they could catch it because they had a slightly better thermoregulation than the other animal. And the biggest difference be between us now is that we are superb thermoregulators. That's why you sweat so much, ladies and gentlemen, which you find. Sweat. sweat. That's why you sweat so much. Yeah. And, and anything that we do is got an evolutionary reason. So we are the best hot weather runners. In, there's no animal that can stay with us in the heat. Okay. And that's because we had to hunt in the midday in Johannesburg because that's when it's hot and that's when the lions were sleeping. And you can't go out at night because the lions will eat you. Okay. So, so for 3.5 million years, we've done very well without being told what we should eat. And as soon as we were told what to eat, things went wrong. Now, this is the time course of our brain development uh, in time. And here's going back. This is Australopithecus first developing. And actually, most of that occurs in the recent past. And the, I'm not absolutely certain why that is, but there's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff coming out now that humans reached a bottleneck about 200,000 years ago, and all of humans were down to a population of about 600 humans living at Pringle, uh, Pinnacle Point. I don't know if you know, who know that theory. There's a major, major theory that we are all derived from 600 humans who lived at Pinnacle Point, just outside Mossel Bay. We couldn't afford the green peas. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> About 200,000 years ago, and there's a whole, it's a fabulous, fabulous story. And, uh, and the, what happened was there was such bad climate change that humans were wiped out across the world, entire world. And the only place where you could live and you had access to carbohydrates and fats and proteins was near Pinnacle Point. And there are very many reasons why that is so. But it's a, it's a fabulous story. And the evidence is, is really quite compelling from both ge uh, genealogical studies and now the archaeological evidence that they're finding at, at Pinnacle Point. Fabulous, fabulous story. But anyway, the point was, it turns out at the intertidal zone, you can get so much fat and so much protein from mussels and all these fish that that may have been the turning point that produced this big, big brain increase here. But that's still under, undergoing. But if you look around, who were the healthiest people in the world in 1800? And these were them, the Plains Indians. And they ate one food, this animal. The, the Spaniards gave them the, do, the horses, and they became expert killers of these animals. And how do we know they were healthy? Because when we look at their size, they were the tallest people in the world. 
these were these these were the groups, and the Australians unfortunately lost out this one. <laughs> but the these guys were the were the were the healthiest, and they were magnificent. If you see pictures of their faces, were magnificent. And if you want to know when a skull, how old a skull is, if it's got full teeth, you know it, it's probably before the agricultural revolution, because the agricultural revolution was a disaster for our health. We lost all our teeth. And, and, but before that, eating this food, you'd have perfect teeth. And they had very broad faces. And the more carbohydrate you eat as a child, your face becomes thinner, and your, your maxilla doesn't develop properly, and you get too many teeth in your face. And then you have to have your, your wisdom teeth removed. So there was a guy called Weston Price who traveled throughout the world in the 1930s. And he, looked, he took pictures of all these populations which had not yet started eating the, the Western diet. And they had these magnificent faces and magnificent teeth and no disease. No, none of the chronic diseases. And it just got hidden. So, so that's really interesting. But these guys search for the fat. They search for the fat in these animals. And that's what they look like today. Yeah. And what's happened? They're searching for the white man's diet. They are not designed to eat the white man's diet. These people are profoundly carbohydrate intolerant. And because they ate fat until 100 years ago. So there's no hope for them. They got, can't adapt quickly. So that's a tragedy. Right, so, and then we followed them. <laughs> and, and please notice this oak's smaller, hey? He's losing height. And, and, and that's what I, I'm really, because I'm six, I turned 64 in about two months' time. And what I'm watching for is people my age, whether they're getting thinner, I mean light, taller, less tall because you start to get less tall and your brain goes. And, if your, bra and your brain goes, the more carbohydrate you eat at my age, the quicker it goes. That's, that's the evidence. Anyway, so this is American obesity rates in 1985. These are greater than 10%, these states. And this is 2010, greater than 30%. That's how it's changed. In 20 years, it's same genes. It's not, it's not genetics, although what you eat has an epigenetic effect. So we know now that what the mother eats during pregnancy and what you feed the child early on in, in its child, childhood influence the genes and the expression of those genes. And the more carbohydrate, the more carbohydrate addicted they become. The easier they become addicted. So this is what's happening in America. These are the obesity and diabetes rates. So you can see the size of that tells you something. And my colleague said, why mess with success? This is success. This is nutritional success. And the answer is it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. <laughs> yeah, and we won't go take that further. Okay, so now I'm going to explain to you how you can all be as thin as you were when you were in matric. Okay, and, and it's simple. And you're all disciplined people, and you're clever, so it's going to happen. Okay, if you want it. Right, different models of obesity. The one model is the energy balance model. Calories in is greater than calories out, so you just store them as fat. And so if you get fat, it's your problem. And the other model is what I call the failed homeostat model, in which addictive food choices cause obesity in those with carbohydrate insulin resistance. So it's got two components. It's got a brain component and a peripheral component, uh, whether you can metabolize carbohydrate or not. Right, this is model one, which is taught in every single medical school around the world, everywhere. This is uniform, and it was not taught before the 1960s. In the 1950s, this model was not taught at all, because they knew it was bogus. They knew it was wrong. I was reading a book today on the, from 1917, and I tweeted a whole bunch of stories from it. And they said, carbohydrates cause you to be fat. And you know, if you want to get thin, you don't eat carbohydrates. So it was, that was standard knowledge in the 1950s. So here we go. Energy intake greater than energy expenditure, so it causes weight gain. And therefore, if you're heavy, it's because you're slothful and gluttonous. You are the cause of the problem. And I promise you, that's what the doctors think when they see a fat person. They think you're gluttonous, and it's your problem. And so we blame the victim for the problem. And so to remain ideal weight, all you have to be motivated, disciplined, focused, eat less, exercise more, and it'll solve the problem. 
Well, the only problem, as Gary Torbs describes in this book, because he reviews all the evidence for this model, is you just get hungry. That's all that happens if you do this. Because your weight is homeostatically regulated. At whatever it is, it's homeostatically regulated. Your weight, you're not graining huge amounts of weight day on and day out. It's relatively stable. So there's a homeostat working. It may be not fixed, but it's, it's, it's working partially well. So this advice that we have given people for the last 50 years doesn't work because people get hungry. And the only diet that will work in the long term is one that does not make you hungry. Because appetite is the key regulator of the whole thing. And if you can't regulate appetite, you can do what you like, but you will never be thin. So appetite's the key. So the problem with this model, it can't be true. Because in a homeostatically regulated system, energy, energy, any reduction in energy expenditure, if we're doing less exercise, it has to be matched by an exactly equal reduction in energy intake. If you do less exercise, you must eat less. That's a homeostatically regulated system. And one of the Coca-Cola scientists who's just published a major paper has shown that in the last 50 years, Americans are doing 100 calories less energy expenditure at work. 100 calories a day. So he says, well, of course, that's why we're all fat. That's rubbish. 100 calories in a homeostatically regulated system, you would just do eat 100 calories less. You just won't eat those three slices of bread. That's all. And you're back in homeostasis. So if that hasn't happened, the homeostat's messed up. So the problem must be that the homeostat became broken. That's the only conclusion you can have. And so this model it doesn't work because it's brainless. It's brainless. And we aren't, we, the brain drives everything, as you know. The role of homeostatic control of body weight through the modulation of hunger and the role of addictive food choices. If you don't include those, you cannot explain anything. More exercise and less of the same food simply makes the patient more hungry, and eventually the system fails because they will rebel and they won't want to do it. And the key to managing obesity is to understand that it's a disease of food addiction with loss of homeostatic control of body weight. And unless you understand the food addiction component, you can't solve it. And it doesn't matter how old the child is or person, you've got to treat the food addiction. Okay, so that's the problem. We've got to put the brain back into the model. Now this is model two, which was what was taught up to 1950, but they didn't talk about food addiction because the processed food industry hadn't yet grown. And we didn't know how foods influence your brain and that sugar and refined carbohydrates are as addictive as heroin and cocaine. Sugar is as addictive as cocaine. Yeah. Okay, so here's the brain. And we now know from studies done in the last five years or so that you can predict children who are going to be fat as children because of their response to food from a young age. And those who are easily satiated will not get fat. And those who are not easily satiated by the same amount of food will get fat in long, the long term. So it's the re regulation of appetite in the brain that ultimately determines your body weight. But it's compounded by this, addictive foods. And what addictive foods is they increase your energy intake. And the energy output is the other side. But ultimately, I'll show you that your energy output goes down as you get fatter. As you get fatter, you do less exercise. We're not sure of the biology of it, but it's, but it's clearly that. And the next thing you need to understand is energy into your body is partitioned. And you either store it as fat or expend it as energy. There's, one of, there's only got those two options, expend it as energy or store it. Now, how much you store as fat is determined by this hormone, insulin. And insulin, remember, is the hormone that is secreted when you eat carbohydrates. And the main function of insulin is to make fat. It is the fat-making hormone. And you never hear that. People never tell you that it's not cortisol or whatever. It's insulin that drives fat. And not only that, it drives fat storage and prevents the fat from being accessed. So as long as your fat is, your insulin concentration is high, you cannot access that fat. And what happens then? You store the fat. And for some reason, the brain gets the message that you've got lots of energy stored as fat, but it's not available. And so you're constantly hungry, and you, become, you decrease your activity. Because the brain says, I'm starving. Get me food. I can't do physical activity. I'm starving. And so the treatment of this condition, you get, you've got to get the fat out. 
and then you get rid of the hunger, and then you get the physical activity rises. And this is determined by the degree of carbohydrate or insulin resistance. So I've showed you that. We're not all the same. And the more insulin resistant you are, the more insulin you secrete, the more fat you store and the fatter you get. So that's why insulin resistance is so important. So how do you treat it? You prevent hyperinsulinism. You prevent your insulin rising. You've just got to keep the insulin as low as possible. And that means remove high carbohydrate addictive foods. And that, that's crucial. So there are the two models. This model clearly doesn't work. If it worked, Americans wouldn't be fat because they're all told, told not to be fat, but they are. And this is the model that works. Because when you apply this model and you get people off addictive foods, the weight just drops off. And it, it, that is the crucial thing. So what we know now is that we can, each of us, eat so much carbohydrate per day. Only so much. For elite athletes like the Kenyans, they can eat 600 or 700 grams of carbohydrate a day and they stay thin all the time. But they are a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of the world, and there may be other populations like that. But for other people, it may be that at, a, at 200 grams of carbohydrate a day, they're fine, but 250, they start to put on weight. In my case, because of my diabetes, I restrict myself to 25 grams of carbohydrate a day. And if I go over 75, my weight starts to rise again. So I'm very sensitive. I'm at 75 grams. But the point is, for every single person in this audience, there's, a, there's an amount of carbohydrate that's perfect for you. And it's not 700 grams. It's, and, and I don't think for most of us it's even 200 grams. There's, there's absolutely no reason why people need more than 200 grams of carbohydrate a day. I've had some really interesting experiences. I've had one world-class triathlete who decided just to change his diet. He went on to this high-fat diet. He cut his carbohydrate to 25 like I do. And he said it was a total disaster. He couldn't run. He didn't like life, et cetera, et cetera. He just increased it to 100 grams a day. In other words, 75 grams a day, which is hardly anything. It's a few sandwiches. And he said, I'm running better. I'm performing better than I ever have in my life. And that's the key. He was probably eating 700 grams, which was way too much. And if you're taking 700 grams of carbohydrate, you are not getting the nutrition that you need from the other foods because it's the foods which have fat and protein which have all the nutrients. So he was now getting just enough carbohydrate and the perfect amount of the other foods that he needed. So, 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 that, so that's my, my final point to you, is that, that this is how I now believe the system works. And it's the food addiction that you have to solve. And you have to understand if you're carbohydrate resistant, you can't eat much carbohydrate. And when you get the two together, they're working together, you will lose, lose all the weight you need to. The, but the key is to understand you've got to cut the carbohydrates. You've got to be absolutely religious on the carbohydrates and find what works for you. And the people who, who are utterly religious and who utterly understand carbohydrates, they're the ones who lose the most weight and who understand their addictions. And you must understand the addictions. That, that literally, if you go back, and if, you, if pasta is your addiction, and you go and have a plate of pasta, you will get sick, because once you're off pasta for long enough, you will get sick as soon as you eat it. But your addiction will start again the next day. And it's the same with sugar. So you, this is for life. If you want to be lean, and you've got an addiction, that addiction has to go for life. And it, you will be, you'll be fine. And so, so the dietitians who say these diets are unsustainable, that, that's quite true for people who've got the addiction and they just go back to the addiction. But if you can fight the addiction, your weight will stay stable for the rest of your life at this perfect weight. What we now know too is that the controls for appetite change. They're not fixed. And as you eat the right diet and you get your appetite under control, the, the brain cells change. They actually change to support you and help you in that choice in the future. And finally, sorry, I mean, there'll never be a finally, but. <laughs> <laughs> I was tested recently. We've, worked, we've got a, a subliminal test for if you've got carbohydrate addiction. And I was one of the first who was tested on. And they said, you haven't got a carbohydrate addiction. You've got a carbohydrate revulsion. And, and why this diet works so well is because the rules are so clear. They are so simple and so clear. And what humans do then is that's in their mind and they think about it all the time. 
and then they become, you get the subliminal, so if you walk in tonight, so there was orange juice and there was no water for me, because I was looking for the water. When I saw the orange juice subliminally in the past, I would have gone straight for it. But now my subliminal says, no, you, that you don't eat that. So I walked past it and didn't see it. And that's what you have to get to. And then you're over the addiction. But it, all addictions are stimulated by subliminal messaging. And you have to get over the subliminal messaging. And then you can be cured. So the key to the cure is you've got to get rid of all the subliminal messaging and you've got to rewire your brain to say, no, that food kills me. I will not eat it. Yeah. And for me, it's easy. If I eat carbohydrates, I'm going to die of diabetes. So it's simple. But, and if you have a real reason, then it's easy. It's more difficult if you're 25 and, and you want to lose a few kilos or something. Then it's more difficult. Okay, so final slide. Oh, no, in fact, uh, something's gone wrong with this slide. I don't know if we can read it. Maybe we can. The greatest obstacle discovery is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. It's the illusion of knowledge. And what I've told you tonight is that there's an illusion of knowledge, that we know what health nutrition is best for you. And I've tried to put doubt in your minds and suggest I may not be right, but what I can tell you is the other argument is also not right. And I hope I've given you that argument. I have observed that the world has suffered far less from ignorance than from pretensions of knowledge. And I've tried tonight to show you that that we pretend we know all about nutrition, but it's much more complex than we know now. I will give you the final, this is definitely the final statement, we have some questions. The future of understanding human health is what you contain in your gut flora. The bacteria that you have in your gut determine your health. That's a bold statement, but it will be proved to be true. That we now think that the bacteria that you have in the gut, there are 10 trillion bacteria in the gut, and you've only got one trillion cells. So we've got 10, 10 trillion cells sitting inside us. And we evolved with those, those bacteria almost as parasites, so they must have a parasitic role. And one of the best ways I can help you think about that is think of the giraffe. What does the giraffe eat? It doesn't, does it eat a balanced diet? It eats acacia plants. That's all it eats. Now, I'm not a, not a food scientist, but I'll bet if you took an acacia plant and analyzed it, you'd see it doesn't have many vitamins in it. So where are the vitamins coming that is keeping this giraffe alive? They're coming from its own gut. The bacteria are generating the nutrients that animal needs to live. And humans are no different. We co-evolved with bacteria in the gut. And in the last 120 years, they have changed dramatically. We know that from what we used to have. And I was reading a paper in Science this morning or yesterday where they showed that in mice, the bacteria talk to the intestinal cells. They talk to the intestinal cells. And they talk to the immune system as well. So the Nobel Prizes I spoke about are going to be found by the people who understand the gut flora and how it's abnormal in disease. So in my view, most chronic illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis You've got to look at the gut. You have to find out what's going in the gut because the gut is leaking proteins and they are the cause of the inflammatory response that you get in many chronic diseases. So that's the future of medicine and nutrition. And we can't just go on saying carbohydrates are good for you because this, that, and the other. It's much more complex than that. Thank you very much for your attention. So question. My understanding is that the, the Afrikaners South Africa used to have a very high uh, I disagree with that. I think, I think it's wrong. I know that's the statement. That's why the Springboks are all Afrikaans, why the Locks are all Afrikaners. Because they've had this fantastic nutrition for hundreds of years. Yeah, so I mean I'm being facetious, but I, they, they've had the best nutrition. The trouble is they started eating sugar. And that's the problem. And a lot of the Afrikaans diets, I would guess, like Cook Sisters and so on, are full of sugar. So if, if they would just stay off the sugar, they would have a very good diet. But thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that my brother runs an anti-aging clinic in Canada, and he's 
just done a nutrition, uh, I'm at a master's in nutrition, and he told me exactly what you told me. Um, he told me that about two years ago, and I lost 12 kilograms, and I do exactly what you said. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, the, I might add that insulin is the aging hormone. Every time you spike your insulin, you activate aging processes in the cells. Yeah. Just in terms of going back to red meat and eggs, yeah. um, and your point about flora, I read an article recently from the Economist, yeah, right. where they've actually discovered now that there's a compound in red meat and eggs, which the gut flora process and the byproducts by the liver are what go directly to hardening of the arteries. And the other sad thing about red meat is that I spoke to Ivan Cohen, and he said that when you bry red meat, <laughs> You, the, the carbon from the, the wood smoke mixes with the proteins of the, of the, of the red meat, yeah. which is apparently the most carcinogenic compound available today, which causes most of the cancer of the colon. Okay, a first point that there is a lobby, global lobby against meat. And whenever a study is published on meat, the, it is funded and supported by the global anti-meat industry, because no one wants this, the ideas I've spoken tonight to become globally accepted because the processed food industry will collapse overnight. Those data are, comp I mean, the, the arguments that he presented are, are so trivial, you cannot make the conclusions that, that were drawn in that paper in The Economist. You can't, The Economist, you cannot draw those conclusions. They've been highly debated on the internet. And th th there's too many steps between, you know. Now, I, I don't actually promote a high meat diet. I promote a high fat diet. If I could get the carcasses of animals, I would just eat the fat. Yeah, I would eat the liver and the fat sitting around the kidneys. That's what I'd, and the bone marrow and the brain, that's what I'd be eating. I'm not a meat proponent, yeah. Um, okay, so Tim, I'm not as dedicated as you to slowly put carbs yeah. into my diet to yeah. find where my level is and, you know, is it 75 grams, is it 25 grams? Um, and tying into that, I've heard about the, the blood type diet, which sort of says, you know, if you're B, you should be eating dairy and bread, and if you're O, you should just be eating meat and veggies. So, can I sort of put two and two together and say, if I'm type B blood type, I'm probably more carb resistant or less resistant, or is there a link between blood type and your carb resistance? Firstly, carb resistance is clearly genetic. Uh, my father, diabetes, and if you have a diabetes in the family, you're much more likely to be carb resistant. So, but it's not through the ABO genes, it's through other genes. Fortunately, most people are O and most people are put on, put on the high fat diet, so most people will benefit. But so there are many carb resistant people who are A and they don't benefit from that diet at all. You, you have to understand, we, everyone's an individual. And some people will find dairy very acceptable and others won't. And, and that, you have to find out what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I have both, between us, lost about 20 kilos this November, including uh, Christmas and the holiday. And I want to take issue when you say that the, the desire to eat carbs is in the brain. Because yeah. when you cut it out, you walk through that supermarket, and 75 or 80 percent is carbs. Yeah. And you have no desire anymore yeah. to eat them. Yeah. Thank you. Because you've got over the addiction, you see. And, that, and you've You've reprogrammed your brain, so now when you see it, you see it. It's not the brain, man. Well, thank you. There's so much literature and everything being spoken about the special gene that is producing breast cancer. And yeah. people are willingly having double yeah. mastectomies, whatever. Yeah, sure. But now you're relating the eating of too much carbohydrate to breast cancer. Yeah. So are you saying the two are going together, yeah. or are you saying what they're saying is I'm, not correct? Or? I know, no, there's always genetics. I mean, it's clear, there's clearly a genetic component, and, and I mean, she, Alex, what's her name, Jolie, it described that she has about an 85% chance of getting breast cancer. I mean, that is huge. You know, if you've got 85 out of 100 people are going to get breast cancer, that's huge. But the, but the mechanism will be, it'll be, in my view, an insulin-driven mechanism. It's because she just, you're just more prone to it. So this, those cancer cells are even more likely to become cancerous. But the mechanism causing it, I think, 
will be shown to be insulin glucose. Diabetes, diabetes and breast cancer are linked together. I mean, if you don't get diabetes, you get breast cancer. You know, it's almost the two go together. So I think, and, and again, remember what I said about the Warburg effect, that cancer cells can only burn glucose. They cannot burn fats. And if you can starve them of glucose, they have to regress. Yeah. Professor Nax, um, so your previous um, book on the law of running and so on um, was, a, was a proponent of endurance sport, carbo loading, and, and then the runners in those days used to drink Coke and, that, uh, Coke and water, and yeah. so that's a lot of sugar in the run. So what are you saying about people who do endurance sports now? Should yeah. they be eating fat the night before and not drinking <laughs> Coke at all? What are you saying they do for endurance sports now? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think in general, just a general statement, we shouldn't be eating, we shouldn't be drinking carbohydrates in the way that it's delivered, like Coca-Cola and so on. You know that four tons of sugar was dumped on the two oceans marathon runners. Four tons during the race. Now, now they thought they were doing something healthy and they've got all this extra sugar. Okay, but, but now let's go back to it. Take Bruce Fordyce and Oscar Chalupski. They are now burning fat most of the day. And because their exercise is not sprinting flat out over a short time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, they find because you can cover it all with fat. And so they can compete if they want to just taking fats during the race and not needing to carbohydrate load. I think that for a short distance, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I suspect if you can use carbohydrates, you'll about do better. So I think there's a selection that the very, very, very best athletes in the world burn a lot of carbohydrate and they're carbohydrate tolerant. But if you aren't carbohydrate tolerant, what happens is you put on weight and then you can't compete at that level. So, that, so that's, that's a gym. But if you're carbohydrate intolerant, eating carbohydrate is a waste of time. It just turns to fat anyway. Yeah. So we have lots of people doing the Iron Man taking fat, just eating fat. Yeah. And they do fine. Because your liver can produce plenty of glucose if you train it properly. Yeah. But you're lean, so you can do what you like. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Um, I was in your class about 14 years ago. Oh, that's right. Um, and you said then that 50% uh, of what we learned today on that day uh, will be out of the window, and carbo loading is out of the window. Yeah. Then um, I would like to ask now this can, you, can this not, because I remember that slide of the crab cycle. Yeah. Can this not be described, just summarized, as a crab cycle where you get that. that which we never looked at, the yeah. one arm that goes to, to, to ketogenesis. Yeah. But we all, we all looked at the cycle yeah. and the 36 or 26 ATPs that are produced in that cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can this not, because I, I see a lot of studies in there, but if, if you can just summarize, can I just summarize this by looking at the Krebs cycle and the one arm that forms um, the, the ketones? Thank you. Good. Well, you know, you get so much more energy from fats because the fat goes right through the Krebs cycle as you, and it generates much more ATP. You're quite right. But, but ketones clearly are very crucial. And it's funny because when I started my work at UCT, the, almost the first experiment I did was we had beating hearts and I gave them ketone bodies and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the very first PhD, I helped a guy called Johan Kuslag. I'll, I'll just give you this little story, which is really interesting. And he'd read about post-exercise ketosis. Ketosis is when you develop the ketones and you get this terrible bad breath, etc. But the ketones are there for a very good reason because, for example, when you're starving and under any circumstances, you burn the ketones in your brain. And if we didn't have that capacity, we would be dead as a race because we wouldn't have survived starvation. And so we, we, we did the experiments and I was one of the first guys and I'd, what I did was I ate a high-fat diet for two days and then I ran on a treadmill for two, day, for, for two days, for two hours. <laughs> and afterwards, I got this huge ketosis, and that was one of the first times that had been seen in recent times. So he realized that carbohydrates prevent the ketosis. But what was really interesting in me, looking back, was even though I hadn't eaten carbohydrates for, for two days, and I'd exercised for two hours, my glucose should have gone down, and it actually went up to a very high value. 
And that showed that I was pre-diabetic already. That's a diabetic response, which, which is amazing, but of course we didn't know. But it's helped us now because we think we might be able to detect who's prone to diabetes from a young age by testing them during exercise. But your point is quite correct, so that you get this incredible energy from burning fat, and the ketones are hugely useful fuels in the body. That's correct. Yeah. I'm diabetic, uh, type yeah. 2, yeah. over here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I have been for the past 13 years, and I probably was, that's when I was diagnosed, I probably was for about five years before that. And um, I was on a high carb, low protein diet, low fat diet, and my blood sugar levels were around 7 or 8. I then went on to, about nine months ago, I got your book, and I then went on to your diet, and my blood sugar levels have come down to five and a half to six and a half. Mm. So that shows that that side of it, mm. I yeah. think, is good. I've also cut out all processed foods that I, that I can. So that's worked. The problem is, during those nine months, my cholesterol level went up yeah. from four to five, yeah. and the bad cholesterol went up to about 3.2. And my doctor then threatened to put me on Statistics. cholesterol medication, so I said, give me six weeks. And in that six weeks, I went off fatty red meat. I got proteins from fish and white meat, etc. And the cholesterol level came down. So the question is, <laughs> how do I get around that problem? Because the fatty red meat does seem to push my yeah. cholesterol level yeah. up. And my wife was sitting next to me, and I like fatty red meat, but she won't let me eat it. <laughs> okay. Help would be great okay. So this was the one bit I didn't go into, but thank you for that story about that your glucose control is much better, and it's easy to explain why it happens. It has to happen. No diabetic should be eating more than 25 grams of carbohydrate a day. That's it. If you want to live a long time as a diabetic, you've got to get your glucose down even lower than what you're suggesting the lower the better, you know, you're doing incredibly well. But there's a guy called Richard Bernstein who's been diabetic since for about 70 years now without any complications, he's insulin dependent. And he's kept his glucose at about 4.8 all day. And he's got no arterial damage. So diabetes means nothing. If you control your glucose, you don't have to have any of the complications. And so the complications are due to the high carbohydrate diets, that's it. So congratulations on that one. Okay, now let's get to the cholesterol story. Right. You have to read the cholesterol controversy, and you said a value of five. So what's magic about a value of five? That in your mind, the five is important. Well, 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 my doctor said for a diabetic, that's on the borderline of going too high. That's what he said. Yeah. Um, well, in diabetes... about the bad yeah. cholesterol, the yeah. 3.2. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's just move away from diabetes, but just... I wasn't me, yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. You see, if we look at cholesterol, the only group in which cholesterol has a small predictive value, notice small predictive value, is in people under the age of 50. Once you're over 50, the cholesterol has got no related predictive value whatsoever in healthy people. None whatsoever. So it doesn't matter if you was 5, 6, 7, or 8. There's no science to show that that's a predictive, going to predict your problems. That's point one. Point two, women should never, ever, 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 ever have their cholesterol measured. Never. Yeah, women. Because, because there is, it has never been shown in women that your cholesterol level predicts your risk of heart disease. There is no predictive value at all to cholesterol. And in, in studies that are not funded by industry, the women who do best have a cholesterol of seven. Yeah. And if it's below seven, you don't want it. You don't want a cholesterol below seven if you're a woman. Okay. Now let's, let's look at your situation. You have no heart disease. Uh, okay, you have a risk in diabetes, and you've got cholesterol of just on five. And, I, and you come to me and I say, okay, you must take statins. Now, if I were to ask you how many percentage of people taking statins must benefit for, for you to want to take them? So let's say I have 1,000 people. Okay, let's say there are 300 people here. 
and now we get a thousand people all the same and they all the doctors have diagnosed that their cholesterol is above five, they don't have heart disease, they could have high blood pressure, they could have other risk factors, but they don't have established heart disease. And I put all thousand of you on statins. And now we follow you for five years. And at the end of five years, we all get together again. And how many of us would you want to say, I benefited from that medication of that thousand who started for you to want to use the medication? And this is, this is what you have to ask your doctor. Okay, it's a thousand people. Would you accept if a thousand people benefited, would you take it? Yeah, okay. If 900 benefited, would you take it? Now remember, you were good, excellent. If 800 did, okay, so it's 8 out of 10. If 700 did, okay. If 600 did, okay, there's some no's. That's really interesting. If you're on medical aid. Okay, 500? No. no. 400? No. Okay, so I get the cutoff is between 500 and 400 and 500. Yeah, 500 is sort of cut. So you want a one in two chance. Okay, so what do you think the data shows? These are, the, these are data from the industry itself who makes the product. How many? 1%. You're quite right. It's, it's 1.8. It's 18 out of 1,000. 18 out of 1,000. But you never told that. You never told that. Now, what happens if you go on my diet and you change your cholesterol and other things, your, your glucose, and you start to exercise and you lose weight and you bring your blood pressure down because you exercised and lost weight? Much greater benefit. Hugely much better greater benefit. So the answer for you is you must do everything else and your cholesterol actually is a bit low. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Um, as a vegetarian, would I be as successful with your diet? Yes, you would. But, but you, you have, have to go, go the fat route. route. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you have, to, you have to go and eat lots of fat. Because it's very difficult for vegetarians to eat. So my diet, actually, if, if you exclude a little bit of meat and fish that I eat, it's a lot of vegetarian foods, yeah. And, but a lot of fat. Yeah, yeah. Um, Uh, the books that are for sale on site.